Let's look at the relationship of the time response to the frequency response. Um, there are some studies um, that you will do probably later in your in your education in your career where you'll look at uh, what goes on with the time response versus a frequency response um, and looking at the waveforms. Time response typically is, is something that you measure on an oscilloscope. Frequency response is something that you would measure on a spectrum analyzer. At some point hopefully you'll be able to uh, use a spectrum analyzer and uh, do some uh, analysis of the frequency response. Uh, a definite relationship exists between time, pulse response, and frequency response. The fast rising and fall, falling edges of a pulse waveform contain the higher frequency components. The flatter components of the pulse waveform, which are the tops, and the baseline of the pulses represent slow changes or lower frequency components. The average value of the pulse waveform is its DC components. Something else that you know that you might be uh, exposed to later in your career, something called a Fourier analysis. And uh, a Fourier analysis actually looks at a waveform and determines what the high and low frequency. Uh, components are that make up the waveform. So we can see here the relationships of pulse characteristics and frequency content of pulse waveforms are indicated. And if you look at just look at the waveform, it says the rising and the falling edges contain the high frequency components and the tops or the flat portions contain the low frequency components. For the RC integrator, in terms of the frequency response, the RC integrator acts like or as a low pass filter. As you learned, the RC integrator tends to exponentially round off the edges of the applied pulses. This rounding off occurs to varying degrees depending on the relationship of the time constant to the pulse width and period. The rounding off of the edges indicates that an integrator tends to reduce the higher frequency components of the pulse waveform. So if we take a look at the, uh, the waveform for the circuit here, time and frequency response relationship in an RC integrator, one pulse in a repetitive waveform. So they're telling you that the rising and the falling, the leading and the trailing edges of the waveform have your high frequency components associated with it while the top, the flat portion, has your low frequency components. And you can see on the output, the high frequencies are reduced. You have a longer um, T, um, a longer time, and then on the, sa the same thing, the aver at the average, same average value out here on the uh, falling edge here. The low frequencies here where it really flattens out um, is where you find your low frequencies being unaffected. <clears throat> so like the RC integrator, the RL integrator also acts as a basic low pass filter because the inductor is in series between the input and the output. The inductive reactance X sub L is small for low frequencies and offers little opposition it increases with frequency, so at higher frequencies, most of the total voltage is dropped across the inductor and very little across the resistor, the output. If the output is DC, the inductor is like a short, X sub L equals zero. At high frequencies, the inductor becomes an open as illustrated. So again, we look at the, the typical circuits that we've seen so far. Um, the inductor acts like a short. Ideally here, okay, the inductor approximates an open where X sub L is high when we have a high frequency input, you know, whereas for DC, it, initial, it initially acts like a short. So with your square wave input, you can see that that square wave input translates to high frequency components being reduced. So that gives you your low pass filter action. For the RC differentiator, in terms of frequency response, the RC differentiator acts as a high pass filter. As you know, the differentiator, 
differentiator tends to introduce tilt to the flat portion of the pulse. You get that, that uh, exponential curve on the top. As you know, the differentiator tends to introduce the tilt. It tends to reduce the lower frequency components of a pulsed waveform. Also, it completely eliminates the DC component of the input and produces a zero average value. This action then can be illustrated in the, uh, the, the circuit below. The, again, like the DC, like RC differentiator, the RL differentiator, it also acts as a hot, basic high pass filter because the inductor is connected across the output less voltage is developed across it at lower frequencies than at higher frequencies. There are zero volts across the output for DC, ignoring any winding resistance. For higher frequencies, most of the output voltage is dropped across the output coil, X sub L equal to zero for DC, and X sub L approximately equal to the an open for the high frequency. So. If you take a look at figure 2051 and 2050, um, it runs. You you can see the uh, the high and low frequency components and the output where the low frequencies are reduced and the higher frequencies are unaffected. So you can see here for DC, you essentially have a short across the output, so everything appears to be. Um, everything appears to be um, with the resistor then to ground. Uh, at high frequency input it opens, the inductor opens, and so we end up with our input uh, square wave then be interpreted as a low frequency component reduced or a high pass filter. Formulas for relating the time response to the frequency response, the fast transitions of a pulse, the rise time, T sub R, and the fall time, T sub F, are related to the highest frequency component, F sub H, in the pulse by the following formula. So you can see we have our rise time, T sub R, we have F sub H here as our frequency, high frequency component. Okay, so this formula also applies to fall time and the fastest transition determines the highest frequency of the waveform. So it can be arranged so you can say well the high frequency component 0 0.35 by T sub R the rise time or T sub F the fall time. So we look at an example here what is the highest frequency contained in a pulse that has a rise and fall time equal to 10 nanoseconds. So in this case we run it through the relationship the high frequency uh, component then 0.35 divided by the um, rise and fall time which are the same we end up with 35 times 10 to the sixth Hertz or 35 megahertz. Okay so it allows you to to determine the frequency component in the uh, in in the uh, the circuit there. The last bit here goes into troubleshooting. Typically, I let the let the lab guys go through this, but uh, something you might want to do in your lab uh, and consider uh, what's going on with things like an open capacitor. Um, I don't know if your lab equipment uh, has that capability where you can input, but again, something to uh, to consider something with a leaky capacitor. Basically with a leaky capacitor you've got some resistance uh, in the capacitor itself that's allowing current to flow around the capacitor. And by looking at the waveform you can determine whether or not you've got a good circuit or if you've got a potentially leaky capacitor. You can see here the by the waveform the normal output here for five uh, time constants versus what would happen to the same circuit with a leaky capacitor. You notice that the that the waveform is kind of squashed there. Okay, same thing here. 
you can see that the uh, that the waveform is is uh, distorted here compared to what you would normally expect. A shorted capacitor, where the capacitor has you know a dead short through it, and it can happen for you know any number of reasons. The maybe the capacitor had uh, too much current through it, um, or the it has a bad material. Um, and you can see here with a shorted capacitor that you end up you know with uh, either nothing or you end up with a straight pass through on your signal. If you've got an, a burned out or an open resistor, the output will slowly discharge to zero through the leakage in the resistor or uh, instrument impedance when the resistor is open. Okay, if it happens to be in, in this configuration, in parallel, again, you've got a, uh, a pass through. So in troubleshooting, take a look at some of those things in the lab. Um, see if your, if your lab equipment uh, has the capability to uh, test and simulate this type of output.